But when we fail the Lord from time to time, uh, and we repent and get our hearts right with Him, forsake, you know, that's where the grace comes in. When you can you can tell the difference between someone who's struggling with sin and justifying sin. It's not hard. Yet the body of Christ out there, the false, uh, false body of Christ. False converts, as Paul talks about it, they try to muddy the waters and make it look like it's difficult. It isn't. What, are you justifying sin? Or are you struggling with sin? If someone catches you doing something you're not supposed to do, do you hang your head down low and go, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You're right. I shouldn't be doing that. Or do they hold their head up high? I'm not as other men are as this publican. Yeah. Matthew 3, 9. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father to say unto you, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. I threw that verse in there because you get so puffed up. I alone am left. I'm the only one left. I'm this important. This is the only Bible-believing, God-fearing ministry left. We're just so important. God, you know, the Jewish people in this context, the Jewish people... The Pharisees, we have Abraham. God's of these stones able to raise up Abraham. Elijah, I alone and left. Well, here's Elisha that's going to be priest. And here's 7,000 priests that haven't bowed a knee to Baal nor kissed him. You're not the only one. God will raise people up. If I fall away, if you know, all these brethren that I mentioned fall away, that are in ministry, or, you know, something happens and you know, someone dies or someone gets called to do something else all of a sudden, God will raise people up. God's got everything under control. God will raise men up. If men fail him, he'll raise another man up. Do you guys not remember the story of Saul and King David? King Saul and King David? When Saul failed him, he raised another man up. Amen. That thing gets me. This, it's the end of the world if this ministry fails, especially ministries that are paying ministries. If this ministry fails, it's the end of the world. No, it isn't. God will raise another one up. Peter Ruckman, man, he died. That was, the, that was the end of the world. He was the greatest preacher that ever lived. Probably ever will live. It's just the end of the No, it isn't. God will raise somebody else up. Brother, sister, Christ, have faith. Luke 3, 8. The, again, he, this is uh, John the Baptist. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Once again, if something happens to me, God will raise someone else up. Oh, no, no. God, you need me. I, I, I'm the man. You need me. Without me, it, it won't get done. Something happens to me, brother, says Christ, God will raise someone else up. Okay. But more importantly, He's given you the Holy Spirit, and He's given you His perfect written word. We are all priests. The priesthood of the believer. Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? God opened the scriptures to me. Okay. Praying without ceasing. Now, first, when I say this, I say this, though there are men of God still trying to preach the truth out there, I'm not the only one, brothers of Christ. I'm not the only one preaching truth. Okay? I'm not. But let's say I start getting prideful, start thinking I was. If something happened to me, God would raise someone else up. Let's say it got down to where, where you could only find one. Maybe there was five out there, five out there. But you only found one person preaching truth. And... You know, something happens to that one person. God will show, send you to another one that's preaching truth. God will trust the Lord. Pray about it. Stay in the Word of God and trust the Lord. The point is we need God, not the other way around. God, you need me. How many times, they won't actually say it sometimes, Brother Christ, but how time, many times have you come across preachers that have the attitude that God needs them? Or people, when I used to be a false convert in these battle buildings, there was people in these battle buildings that, that got really prideful. You need me. I'm the one that leads leads the worship team. And, and I'm the one that does the, the children's Bible study. And I do this. And you need me. You need... No. 
God does not need you. God needs me. No, you need God. And I desperately, back then, everyone I came across back then, I believe they're all false, fake. I was false and fake. We all needed God. But today, among the body of Christ, you start having some men that get in the ministry, they get so puffed up, and they start having the attitude that God needs me. No, you need God. I need God. And that's when we need to humble ourselves. And God will raise up people. God will raise people up. God will open doors and close doors. What it comes down to is trusting God. Do you trust God? Are you putting your faith in a man in ministry that's not perfect? Uh, don't put your faith in me. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Put your faith in His Word. That's where your faith needs to reside. Not in wolves in sheep's clothing. A lot of people that I tried to talk to and started getting me down, I felt like I was just talking to a brick wall, trying to preach truth to people. Because they're following wolves in sheep's clothing, people that are leading them astray, false gospels. They're, they claim to be Bible believers when they're not. Okay? You're just hitting a brick wall. Okay? Why? Because their faith is in that man, not Jesus Christ. Not his perfect written word. Romans 12, 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, we're going through this verse again. To think soberly, according to as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Soberly. But, but, but God, you need me. No, you need Jesus Christ. We need God, not the other way around. But soberly. Okay. Now, we all know 2 Timothy 2.15. How do we think soberly? According to God, has dealt every man the measure of faith. How do we do? How do we think soberly? Second Timothy two fifteen. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word. How do you think soberly? The word of God. Are you hiding it in your heart? And living it? Or are you hiding that man's words that you're listening to in your heart and, li and, and living and what he wants you to live, the world wants you to live, what your flesh wants you to live? 1 Corinthians 1.26 For ye see your calling, brethren, how that, that, how that not many wise men after the flesh. I'm seeing that among the body of Christ. Wise men after the flesh. They're starting to get fleshly. They're starting to get worldly. And when they're getting called out for it, they're getting angry. They're getting hateful. They're getting bitter. Not many wise men after the flesh. You can be a wise man after the Lord, which we're going to talk about. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This is the completion of wisdom. God's Word. It starts with fearing God, so you turn to His Word and say, Lord, how do I stay on your good side? How do I please you? This is the end of the wisdom, the words of God. It starts with fearing Him. Okay, you can have men that fear God, but after a while they start getting into the world, and the next thing you know, they start becoming. They started out being wise men who feared God and preached the word, and then they became men that were wise men after the flesh. They started getting into the flesh and worldliness. Not many mighty. I, I'm weak. He is strong. He being capital H. He, God, Jesus Christ. When I am weak, then is he strong. You guys remember that. But when you have people that think they're all mighty and I'm, I'm strong on my own, I, I'm good. Not many mighty. Not many noble. When you start getting into titles, doctor, PhD, you know, pa uh, pastor, you got to call me pastor, or what? they start getting into all these titles. Not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. There's times where I've seen, brothers and Christ, where a man at the bottom that he's saved, he has the word of God, he's never been to Bible college, he's never, I've been to Bible college, but the man's never been to Bible college, okay, and you have a man that stands up there and he's been to college, he's got his PhD, THD, doctor so-and-so, and that man... 
that doesn't have all that, he can confound that man up there behind the pulpit or behind the camera that claims all this, you know, I got all this knowledge and, and I, I uh, authority to do what I'm doing. And he sits there and he can confound him because God will show that man that humbles himself and says, Lord, what do I need to see? Versus the man who thinks he knows it all. That's what this is talking about. Foolish things of the world to confound the wise, the people who think they know it all. And once again, I always point out, remember, Brother Smith, there's a difference between saying it and, and living it. So you have some people say, well, I know I'm not the wisest, but they act like they're the wisest. It's their actions that get judged. I said it was wrong. Yeah, but did you do it? Well, yeah, that's what you're getting judged on. Not you saying it was wrong, but you actually doing it. Remember when uh, Jesus was doing a parable, this is for the kingdom of heaven, but he talked about the two sons where one said, I won't go, but he went. The other one said, I'll go, but he didn't go. Which one of them did the will of my father? Well, the one that went, but he said he wouldn't go. It's not the words oftentimes in the end, it's the actions that God looks at. The wise, I think I know it all, or they act like they know it all. They, Bob talks about they know nothing as they ought to know. Okay. Let's keep going here. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Remember when Jesus came, they thought they were looking for this great man, like this tall man like Saul. They weren't looking for a little boy, King David. You know how King David took out Goliath? They weren't looking for someone who was meek, humble, lowly. They were looking for someone like Saul that was towering. If you read the story, Saul was towering among the people. He was towering over them. Okay. They were looking for someone mighty. But God doesn't pick the things that are mighty. God picks the things that are lowly. He didn't pick Saul because of how big he was. Okay. That's not how God looks. Verse 28, God is the power. God is the authority. God is our strength. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He is my strength. But you got people who think they have their own strength and they can be their own strength. Or that they can find real strength in the world. That they, you know, find strength in their own flesh. No, you need to, you need to get saved. And those of us who are saved, we need to remember our strength comes from the Lord. Verse 28, And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Why? Why? Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. No flesh should glory in his presence. The man that thinks more highly than he ought to think. Or you start getting to that point where I only am left, Lord, and you need me. You need me, Lord, and I'm the only one left. I alone am left. No. You need God. Those are times where you desperately need to get with God and pray and say, Lord, give me strength. It feels like I'm the only one, but I don't want to be like them. I don't want to be part of the falling away. I, I need to keep going. I need to keep being a light for you. I need to keep fighting for the truth. That's when you desperately need to get in prayer and you need to seek God as your strength. When you start looking to yourself and start saying, well, I, I'm the only one left and, and you need me, you're not looking to Jesus as your strength. You're looking at yourself as, as your own strength. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who hath made to God uh, make of God is who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Notice it did not say glory in man, respecter of persons. I'm of so and so. We read about that. It didn't say that. Babel buildings. Glorying in Babel buildings, clubs, groups outside the body of Christ, or groups within the body of Christ starting to separate and form their own groups. We're all supposed to be one in Christ Jesus. Now, when the Bible talks about churches, it's talking about the body of Christ in different areas of the world physically. But we're all one in Christ Jesus. I've always said this before. It's, look how mad, it's, it's insane I've gone through Medford, and there's like 20 or 30 Babel buildings claiming to be Christian. Babel buildings. 
That's insane. That's insanity. That's not Bible. There's only supposed to be one church in that valley, the body of Christ. That's it. Not all these bad... They're businesses. They're realizing they can make money. They can do a club. You can be part of a club. Okay? You're not supposed to be glorying in those things. For we're all, all one in Christ Jesus our Lord. Self-importance. People start getting fallen into self-importance. Me, myself, and I get the glory. Loving the praise of men over the praise of God. Remember I said I got ahead of myself a little bit, but here it is. But not in the Lord. We're not glorying in the Lord. We're not giving God all the thanks and all the praise. We're holding ourselves higher than Him. What would you rather have, brothers and Christ, what would you rather have, and not just here, but here, action. Not just saying, because a lot of people, I know their answer, but does your life reflect that answer, or does your life, the way you live in your life, go against the answer? Right? Remember? Oh yeah, I know I'm supposed to fear God. Oh yeah, I fear God. But your life doesn't show that you fear God. That's what I'm talking about here. What would you rather have? God say, well done, thou good and faithful one? Or men saying, you're the best preacher out there. You're the only Bible-believing ministry ever. You're great. I'd rather have the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful one. I really would. Now, there's some areas in my life that I failed the Lord. I'm trying to get my heart right with them. And before we get caught up, okay, as it like goes back to what I said, people are in a fallen state and they're just so desperate to get caught up because why aren't you desperate to get back to a standing position? When I was talking earlier about some people who are looking for the blessed hope, they're looking for it as an escape from all their problems that they're getting into because they refuse to get into a standing position. They, they love being flat on their face. They love the compromise. They love the world. They've fallen away. They're saved. They're born again, but they've fallen away. And they're just looking for the catching away to solve everything. Why aren't they desperate to get back up on their feet? Repent, forsake, and get back to living for the Lord. Okay. So that God, when he gets up there, God says, Well done, thou good and faithful one. Well done, thou good and faithful one. In these last days, your one-on-one -on -one walk with the Lord is more important than ever, brothers says Christ. No, no, we're just we're dependent on ministries, on live, YouTube channels. We're, we're dependent on Bible building systems. The most important thing you're going to have in these last days, brothers says Christ, is your personal walk with the Lord. Starting the day with the Word of God and prayer and ending the day with the Word of God and prayer. Staying in the Word of God, praying throughout the day, living for Jesus Christ and talk with Him as you're living with Him throughout the day. I talk with the Lord throughout the day. Your one-on-one -on -one walk with the Lord is going to be the most important thing ever in these last days. It's what's going to keep you standing, brothers and sisters in Christ, more than anything. You're going to get encouragement from the brethren, but if you rely on on encouragement from the brethren, you're going to have some hard times ahead. He like said, Satan is infiltrated, wolves in sheep's clothing, everybody's fighting left and right, brethren are falling left and right. What's going to keep you going is your one-on-one -on -one walk with the Lord. For there will be many times when you feel like you're alone, but you're not alone. Was there a time when Paul was physically alone? 2 Timothy 4.16. Go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy 4.16. At my first answer, 2 Timothy 4.16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. He was physically alone, but he wasn't alone. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me. That by my preaching... By me, the preaching might be fully known, and that all Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. When we are alone physically, remember, the Lord stood with me. You're not alone. You know, the number one, if I, if I could say this, and I can say it with a surety, with, by my own experience failing the Lord. 
When you're physically alone, those are the hardest times. Why? Because when you think nobody's watching, oh, up here, oh, I know God's with me. I know God sees all. But down here, you start thinking, I'm alone. Nobody's watching. That's when the temptation comes in hardcore, and you start falling into, you know, resurrecting the old man, start doing things that you wouldn't do if somebody was watching. That's one of the hard hardships that you've got to watch out for. Remember, the Lord stood with me. Jesus Christ is right here. As I'm doing this, it's just Declan and I, but as I'm doing this, the Lord's with me. I'm not alone. We're never alone, brother, says Christ. You truly get saved and born again. You get the Holy Spirit. You have the Word of God. Jesus is with you 24-7. You're in church 24-7. You're in the body of Christ 24-7. You're in Christ Jesus 24-7. Paul, there was times Paul was alone, and, I, and he probably got lonely, but he, the Lord showed him, hey, you're not alone. And then he's sharing it with us. Guess what? When I was, whenever all men forsook me, like I'm, I'm alone, but I'm not alone. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. Sometimes we are stretched thin in the ministry and brethren fall away. Where did Paul have to go through that? Stretched in the ministry and, and, uh, and brethren fall away. 2 Timothy 4. Turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, not 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, the last chapter. Verse 11. When we read this, it says, Only Luke is with me. Okay, only Luke is with me. Let's see if I'm starting in the right place. No, 2 Timothy 4, 8. Go back to 8 real quick. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, the day of Christ. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing that day, looking for that blessed hope. Paul was looking for it. When you have a preacher saying Paul wasn't looking for it in his lifetime, you're, you're dealing with a man that's become worldly. And the world's getting in the way. The flesh is getting in the way, being a man pleaser, whether it's pleasing his wife, his children, uh, family members, neighbors, whatever. He, there's, the world's getting in the way. Don't turn your back on looking, present tense, for that blessed hope with the life that you're living. That's how you look for it. It isn't sitting here saying, is it going to happen today? It's, Lord, how can I live for you today? Because we could go back home today. If you call us home today, what can I get done for you real quick? Before you call us home. Is there things I need to get cleaned up? Have I fallen back into bad habits? What do you, what do you have for me, Lord? I'm ready. I'm living for you. That's what it means to look for that blessed hope. Verse 9, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. There are brethren in ministry that have failed the ministry, they have failed the brethren because they start loving this present world. They become what I call worldly. Their priorities get messed up. It's no longer God, His perfect written word, the ministry, the brethren, and that, excuse me, I say God, the ministry, because if it's God, I put the Word of God in the first part. God and His Word go hand in hand. If His Word comes first, then God comes first. Okay? But it's God comes first to a man ministry. God comes first. The ministry comes second. Being a servant to the brethren comes third. And I've known brethren that that's not the case. Their wives come first. Their children come second. The world comes third. What they want in the world, how they want to live comes for third, and so on and so forth. God takes a back seat. Sometimes he gets thrown in the trunk. His word gets, takes a back seat. Sometimes his word gets thrown in the trunk. But for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. And that's what we're seeing a lot of brethren falling away, because they're starting to fall into the love of the world and pleasing the flesh. Some of them are hiding. Sometimes they're hiding in adi bad addictions. I've known people to do that, where they start hiding in bad addictions. But they're hiding. Okay. Present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Damascus. Now, I'm not saying Cretans love this present world, it's just saying Demas. But he's saying Cretans I, is, is um, to Galatia, is departed unto Galatia to do the work of the Lord. Titus is unto Dalmatia to do the work of the Lord. 
Only Luke is with me. People say only Luke is with him. Everyone turned against him. Only Luke is with him. That's not what this is saying. It's saying we're spread thin. I had to send a guy over here to do the work of the Lord. Brother in Christ went over here to do the work of the Lord. Only Luke is with me doing the work here where, where Paul is. And he says, take Mark and bring him with thee. Mark has to be somewhere doing the work of the Lord. Well, grab him. We need him. God put in my heart to do something and we need more men. For he is profitable to me in the ministry. It also reminds me of when Paul stood there at Athens. This isn't in my notes, but at Athens. He said, it says he was waiting. What was he waiting for? He was waiting for the other men to come. Why? Because before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. It's rare. It should be a rarity. But there are times where God might call a man to stand up like Paul did. He was so vexed by the adult, the you know false gods and everything, that he stood up and started preaching to Athens before the other brethren got there. But as a norm, he waited for him. Why? Because before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. There's no such thing as a one-man show. You should never be in ministry by yourself, men in ministry. You should be working together with other men in ministry. And in these last days, it's hard. It's hard. Okay? But you should never, ever be a one-man show. Okay. Paul was never a one-man show. There was a time where he stood up because he was vexed and his love for the people had compassion for the, 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 the idolatry. That's the word I'm looking for. The idolatry. Okay, they saw uh, to the unknown God. You know, He stood up and started preaching by the Holy Spirit. But he's waiting. When he's going to go do evangelism, when he's going to a new place to start preaching the word of God, he needs people with him. Before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. It's him and Luke. But evidently he's saying, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. We need some more help. We need some more help. Verse 12. Instead of these men, oh, I got, I don't, you have men that say they don't want help. They like being the one man show. I want to point this out. Why? Because then there's no accountability. They're the final authority. They have the final say. That's the other reason. They're the final authority. They have the final say in everything. And there's no accountability. Mm -hmm. For he's profitable to me in the ministry. Verse 12. And Tychus have I sent to Ephesus. Okay, he sent a brother in Christ over to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest. Carpus, another brother in Christ doing work at Troas. Bring with thee the books, but especially the parchments. Okay. The reason I read those things is there's times in these last, especially in these last days, but there's times throughout history where the body of Christ grows and flourishes. Uh, we get persecution and it shrinks down and we get spread out thin. And in these last days, we're stretched thin, brothers and Christ. Just because we're stretched thin, don't don't be like me and fail and say, well, Lord, am I the only one left? Am I? I'm the only one left standing. Be like Elijah. Am I the only one left? I, Lord, I alone am left. Remember, we're stretched thin. There are brethren out there living their life for Jesus Christ every day. There are men in ministry, not just men in ministry, but brothers and sisters of Christ struggling to live for the Lord every day. And they're failing. We're all failing in certain areas. And we need to work harder. But we're struggling with, all, uh, with our heart, with true love for the Lord. We're trying to live for Him. Take His Word, hide it in our heart, and live it. We're stretched thin. It might feel like you're alone, but you're not alone. Okay. Only Luke is with me. Like I said, don't fall for some of those teachers. See, see, only Luke is with them. Everyone forsook him. No. One man forsook. Demas. Okay. And he, this letter is written to Timothy. Say, hey, Timothy, come. we need your help. On your way here, grab Mark. Uh, well, grab some of my stuff because you have to pass through these cities to get to where we are. Uh, I left something here. Can you grab that for me? He's talking to Timothy. He believes Timothy's still standing. So it's not that he, just him and Luke are the only ones standing, like serving the Lord and everything. Yeah, be careful about that. Okay? But there's times where we get, we get spread out thin. This man's over here. That man's over here. This man's over here. We should still always strive to work together with men in ministry. Okay? Never be a one-man show. There might be times where you're by yourself. Paul talked about it. There was times where he was by himself trying to preach the gospel. There might be times where you're by yourself. But remember, you're not alone. Jesus is with you. And that's only if you're put in that position. 
Like God says, hey, the world's getting that bad and you're put in that position. But there's a lot of men who choose to be one-man shows. They're not put in that position. They choose to be one-man shows. They refuse to work with other men in ministry. There's a difference. Okay. Sometimes we, we forget to judge ourselves first. When you start getting up and being you know, puffed up with yourself... Oh, Lord, I alone am left. I, I'm, I'm the greatest there is. You know, not greatest, but you know, you need me, and, and I'm the only one left standing, and if I go, then who's going to be left to preach the truth? And there... Sometimes we forget to judge ourselves first. Another thing that causes a lot of pride, and people getting uh, really lonely, is you start getting too focused on other people. And the number one person you need to be focused on is who? The man in the mirror, or the woman in the mirror, the sister in Christ in the mirror, the, the brother in Christ in the mirror. You need to focus on you and your walk with the Lord. And there's men in ministry that can that need to take some time out from the ministry to get their heart right with the Lord, and they need to walk one-on-one -on -one with the Lord, and they need to focus on their walk with the Lord. They're so focused on everybody else's that they lose sight of their own walk with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11.31 for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. To the brother, sister, Christ as a whole, the first person we're supposed to judge is ourself. Here's the order. Ourself, the brethren, the body of Christ, the lost world. That's the order of that we judge. Ourselves, then the body of Christ, than the world. But people are skipping the first one and they love correcting people in the body of Christ. Some people are ignoring judging the world. And what I mean by judging the world is, is convicting people of sin. You live right and you refuse to do what's wrong. It convicts them of the sin that they're doing. Calling sin out for what it is, not compromising. People are always just trying to preach love, God's love, God's love, and they don't tell people about God's wrath, God's judgment. They don't tell people about hell. Okay. But what I, what I seem to be seeing a lot, Brother Sister Christ, is people really get, I don't know if it's an addiction or something, but they really love correcting one another. I, I mean, to the point where if I said the wrong address to a, a scripture, or I accidentally skipped a word. It might mean something if you skip a word, because every word's important. But I, I, I switch words around, I, I made a mistake. Uh, but some simple things. That you have someone on there that's got to be quick in there to correct that, correct that, correct that, correct every little thing. Okay? Where do we start with correction? We start with correcting ourselves. Okay? For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged... Because judgment is, we are to judge, but when we are judged, uh, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the Lord. The Bible talks about how God will ju uh, chasten, a chasten us as a, a father would a child because of his love for us. To keep us separate from this wicked world. 1 Peter 4.17 we read, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God and it first begin at us. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Start with judging ourselves. Then we judge the body of Christ. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. That's both for saved and lost. We do it in meekness. We do it in love. Loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. And that love is we want to see them get built back up. We see you're doing something wrong. Or you're standing for something that's wrong. And we're trying to help you stand for what's right and build you back up. Okay. 1 Corinthians 5.13 but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. The lost world. One of the ways that you're a light to the lost world is your stand for what's right, your stand for absolute truth. I'll have nothing to do with that wickedness. I don't, someone says, here, you want a cigarette? I don't smoke. That's not just bad for your body, but it's also sin and wickedness. My body's a temple for the Holy Ghost, and it's without, supposed to be without blemish. No, thank you. Drunkenness. Bible says drunk. I don't drink uh, because I've had, I've gotten drunk in my life. I've had brethren around me that are drunk. I'll have nothing to do with alcohol because it's, it's destroyed a lot of men's lives. And the Bible says 
about drunkenness. The Bible says about fornication. The Bible, whatever it is. You're to be a light to this world and it convicts this world. That's what that light is. It's to convict this world that the way they're living is wrong. That because of their sin, they're going to hell to burn for all eternity. And they deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. I deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. That's how we judge the world. By living right and doing right and calling sin out for what it is, sin. When we see it. Judgment starts with self, then the body of Christ, then the lost world, in that order. Some of the brethren are skipping the first step, some of them are ignoring the third step. But boy, do they love to correct one another. I see that in the body of Christ. Boy, do they love to correct one another left and right. Uh, don't skip the steps. Make sure that your walk with the Lord is right. Make sure your heart is right with the Lord. Make sure you're giving Him all the thanks and all the praise, all the glory, all the credit. That's what giving Him all the glory is. And that you're relying on Him for your strength. Luke 18.10 says, when we read Luke 18.10, here's the story. Two men went up in the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank Thee, that I am not as other men are. What's he doing? He's not focusing on himself. He's focusing on everyone else. I'm just not as they are. I'm not as they are. And then he starts going through a list of things that he doesn't have a problem with, but he leaves out the things he does have a problem with. Holding tradition. He's a Pharisee. Holding the traditions of men above the Word of God. Pride. Right? And a lot of other things. But he doesn't mention those things. He says extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. That's when he starts puffing himself up. So he starts with looking at the world. Then he goes to himself and tries to lift himself up. He's not putting himself down so God can be lifted up. He's lifting himself up. And ignoring God, and I believe putting God down. Because he's saying, I I'm equal to God. I'm, I'm as good as God, because he's, I'm not as other men are. He's trying to say he's perfect. Verse 13, And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift so much of his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Me. What's he focused on? What's the first step of judgment? You judge yourself. The publican starts with him. The Pharisee says, I thank God that I'm not as other men are. He's focusing on starting with the other men. I'm not as they are. Right. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Brethren, you need to humble yourself and focus on your personal walk with the Lord first before you worry about others. And I'm just going to put this right to people as hard as I can. You need to focus on you first before you come to me trying to correct me. You need to start focusing on yourself. Yes, Love your brothers Christ. Yes, you've, you've worked on your walk with the Lord. Then by all means come and talk to me if I'm doing something wrong. But you need to focus on yourself and your walk with the Lord first and foremost and make sure that your walk with the Lord is right and that your heart is right with Him in that walk. Okay? Before you worry about the others. Today the brethren are getting so divided over each other's walks and they're so focused on everyone else they're not focusing on themselves first. Men in ministry get so distracted by everyone else's walk with the Lord that their own walks gets neglected. Now understand, men in ministry, they're supposed to feed the church of God what he has purchased with his own blood. They're supposed to guard the flock from wolves and sheep's clothing. I understand that, that part of the being in ministry, you are worried about other men's walks. But if you get so focused, there's I'm just saying, one of the things I'm noticing with men in ministry is sometimes they're forgetting their own walk with the Lord. Their own walk gets neglected. Okay. There are men in ministry that need to take some time out, it says before, and spend, a lot, and spend some time with the Lord one-on-one. -on -one. 
get their walk with the Lord back to being strong again, and get their heart right with the Lord. And that way when they get back into ministry, they're more apt to help people. The more apt to stay true to the Word of God is appreciate, not mishandling the Word of God. Okay? And not more apt to, they're less apt to compromise when they have a strong walk with the Lord one on one. Proverbs 16 9 says, Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Psalms 10 13 says, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand, forget not the humble. What he said, this man went down to his house more justified rather than the other. When you humble yourself, then God can use you. Then God can do something for you when you humble yourself. When you're all prideful, you hold iniquity in your heart, you get very prideful. God can't do much with a man like that. No matter how hard things get, physically or spiritually, you're not alone. First and foremost, God is with each and every one of us. You've got to humble yourself. Not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. And when you feel alone, physically, like Paul was, he wasn't alone. God was with him. John 14, 15 says, If we love, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. That he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. Brothers and Christ, sometimes I think the body of Christ is starting to forget about the Holy Spirit. They get to relying on men. Technology, you know, online YouTube, technology, men, brethren. And they forget to rely on the Holy Spirit. Their personal walk with the Lord. Okay. They're forgetting that. But ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and shall be in you. Verse 18, I will not leave you, this is Jesus Christ, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come unto you. You have the Holy Spirit, you have Jesus Christ. It's that simple. But brother says Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. You have God's perfect written word in your hand. Hopefully you do. Like I said, once again, you need King James Bibles. I'll gladly buy you a Bible and get it to you. Just email this ministry. Okay. The email is in the description box. Okay. And I'll put it in the description of the video too. Again, you can email the ministry and I can get you some Bibles, but you got the Holy Spirit and you got the Word of God. You're not alone. I think what's hurting a lot of the brethren is, is we need to work more harder now than ever, if that's not a good sentence. Uh, we need to work harder now more than ever on our walk with the Lord one on one. Because there's going to be more times, I believe, now and in the future where we're going to feel even more and more alone. And we need to have God's strength. Our faith needs to be strong. Our trust in the Lord needs to be strong. We're not always going to have be able to fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. We've got this, but like I said, on here, how do you know who's saved or lost? Face to face, it's, it's, almost, it's very hard to have fellowship face to face. you got to make sure that one-on-one -on -one walk with the Lord is strong. So when you're in the position like Paul was, where he was physically alone, but God was with him, you still go on strong. You still stay standing. You're not falling flat on your face. You still remain standing for Jesus Christ. Amen. Secondly, there are brethren in the world going through the same struggles and fight. Romans 12.1 says, I beseech you, brethren, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Your bodies, how you live your life. You sacrifice. The old man is crucified with Christ. The new man is raised with Christ. Why is that important? You present your bodies a living sacrifice. 2 Corinthians 6, 4, we read, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience and afflictions and necessities and distress. When you present your bodies a living sacrifice and you start doing things God's way and you sacrifice the old men, this is what you're going to go through. When you live right according to God's word, you're approving yourselves to God. But you, have, you learn to be more patient. You've got you to learn patience. 
Okay? You're going to go through afflictions. You're going to have struggles with necessities. There's times where you might be hurting for food or clothing or uh, you might be having some hard times financially. In distresses, in stripes, physical punishment from the lost world. In imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watching, in fasting. By pureness, by knowledge. Some people just have the knowledge, but the Holy Spirit will bring in all truth. We read about that. I think we read about it. Even the Spirit of Truth, we didn't go that far, but the, the Bible talked about how the Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will bring you into all truth. By long suffering, some brethren are failing because we're getting tired of suffering. And I, I hear you, Brother Scott. There's times where I'm like, Lord, I'm just I'm tired of feeling the way I feel. I'm tired of the depression. I'm tired of you know, trying to witness to my family members. They don't want it. You know, by kindness, by ho by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. How can love be fake? What's their actions? The fake love of today is just, it's a feeling, it's a fleshly feeling. That's the fake love of today. True love is action. Taking God's word and hiding in your heart and living it, that's how you truly love Jesus Christ. How do you love the brethren? Physically being there for them. Taking time out to talk with the brother you disagree with or talk to a brother you think is, is, is wrong. Taking time out to talk to a brethren, period, to encourage them to stay on the right path when they're being tempted. Being there one for no, one another. Spiritually, physically, financially, the best way you can spend your money is on Bibles and helping brethren out with food and raiment. It's the best way you can spend your extra money, brothers and Christ. I know I'll get attacked by some ministries. But, oh, no, no, you can give it to ministry. No, if, if that man needs that's, in, that's trying to be in ministry, if he needs food and raiment, that's money well spent. But when they turn it into a business, a business, that's not money well spent. Okay. Bibles and helping your brothers and sisters in Christ out. That's true love. Saying I love my brothers and sisters in Christ and then turning around and stabbing them in the back and gossiping about them behind their back, bearing false witness, mocking them, name calling, and so on and so forth. Spitting on them. You know, when they're hungry and they need a loaf, you give them a rock. You know, that the whole story that Jesus was talking about giving them a serpent. That's not love. That's not love. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report. I've had evil report about me. When I was just a man in the comment section that said, I love the Lord, I love His word, I wasn't being hardcore on stands, I was just, just a man talking, it seemed like everybody loved me. Nobody would say anything bad about me. The moment I said, Lord, I want to do more for you, and I want to get into ministries, I want to do some Bible studies, I want to be a servant to my brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to help people, the brethren, you know. Next thing you know, I've got people attacking me. i got people bearing evil report, bearing false witness. If you're going to be in ministry, you're going to have people turn on you. When you seemed like, I wasn't neutral, but when it seemed like I was just neutral, just some guy that was neutral, everyone seemed to have not a problem, with, didn't have a problem with me. Is when I started opening my mouth and standing for truth, doing videos, then I started getting evil reports. And sometimes the hardest part, the depression that made me go, I don't want to do, I, I just dropped everything for three months. I was wrong for not saying anything. Forgive me, brothers, again. Forg again, forgive me, brothers, Christ, I was wrong. But... I've gotten even a report from brethren that I love and believe are saved. I've had brethren turn against me. People, I, I don't know, maybe you do. I don't believe anybody understands. I'm the only one that understands. No, I believe, brethren, that some people are having a hard time understanding what it means to be treacherous, a traitor. People think uh, Judas Iscariot it was nothing to Jesus. No, Judas Iscariot was a friend. They spent three and a half years together. Jesus, I mean, Jesus is God, he knows him, but they actually spent time together. A friend that's closer than a brother, they were like brothers. 
All the apostles were like brothers. And the man betrayed him. There's an old song. I'm not saying the whole song is good, but I know some might remember it and say, well, you're taking from this song. Well, it just comes from a song, but a stranger has nothing to gain. And only a friend can come close enough to cause so much pain. When, you, when it says betrayal, that means someone got close enough that you had investment in them. You had love for them. You had investment in them. They're like family. They're close, and they betray you. I've had brethren betray me. Brethren that I believe are saved. The lost world, brothers and Christ, I, that's what got me down. The lost world can make fun of me all they want. They can call me names. Uh, false converts, uh, you know, part of all these different clubs. The, the people who follow Robert Breaker, Gene Kim, Steve Anderson. I know there's a lot of newer names now. I'm, I'm still old school, I know. But I had all those people back in the day. They were always attacking me and they were calling me names and all kinds of stuff and, and mocking me and, and bearing false witness about me. That didn't bother me, okay? They're lost. They need Jesus Christ. They need to get saved and born again. I'm trying to preach the truth to them. If they don't want the truth, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. Let them alone. What hurt is when you have someone you believe is saved, born again, that you've fellowshiped with, that you've invested real love and time with, and they turn on you like that. Evil by evil report. And by good report. Sometimes you get good reports. Oh yeah, he's a good man. He lines up the Bible for the most part. There's some things I disagree with them, but when it comes to the major, we call them major doctrines, but the doctrines, he lines up with the Bible. He's actually a Bible believer. I believe he's wrong here, but that's something that I keep praying that God will show him the truth and open his eyes someday. You get some good reports. As deceivers and yet true, you get told, like I said, stay away from Philip Newton, that man will mess you up. He's a heretic. As a deceiver and yet true. Like I said, I'll sit down with anyone for the first time to talk about anything in the Bible that you disagree with me on, and we'll do a Bible study. I got on Skype and did a video chat with men who were post-trib, and we talked for two hours. And two times, I still didn't get anywhere with that man because the man wasn't following the Word of God. The man kept trying to follow these other men. that he, he's, This man said this, and that man said that. Well, what does the Word of God say? I used to make that mistake. I'm throwing myself into the bus. I used to say Brian Denlinger said this and Brian Denlinger said that when he was tr when Brian Denlinger was preaching truth. Not, not this isn't an attack on him. He was preaching truth, but I kept saying to people, brethren, when I was talking to, him, I said, "Well, Brian says this and Brian said that," as if Brian's the, the foundation of truth. And I got corrected. I'm not saying Brian was Brian never told me to do that. Okay, Brian doesn't tell people to do that, but I did that. And I had brethren correct me. He said, you know you say that a lot? You say Brian says this, and then you'll, you'll quote some scripture or, or the truth and everything. Why don't you just say the Word of God says this? And if Brian lines up with the Word of God, then you both are standing for the, the same truth. And that was a smack across the face that I was being a respecter of persons. Almost like, you know, I'm a Paul, I'm a Paul. What well, Brian said, I had to stop saying. I was newly saved. This back when I was saved for a year, my first year. I was just so excited about truth. Well, Brian said this, and Brian showed me this, and Brian... Brian because he's the one that showed me a lot of truth. He led me to Christ. Okay? Give credit where credit's due. Okay? Right. But you got those people that, uh, you know, the, he, that man, get back to, I almost lost track of what I was saying. The man that I was talking to about post trib in, in pre time of Jacob's trouble, catch away the body of Christ, he kept quoting, well, this preacher says this and this and that, and, and he'll go through the, he'll still use scripture. We were going through the Bible, but he was based off, well, this man said this verse is, is, is proves a post trib, and this man says that verse. Po what I kept trying to bring him back to rightly dividing the word of truth. Who's he talking to in those things? I kept showing that it's for the kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom, because he kept grabbing from Matthew 24. And I, I talked with him. I gave him two chances. And he did the same to me. And he said, he said after the first and second admonition, reject. And I said, absolutely. I have to reject you because you're pre preaching post-trib. And he rejected me because I'm preaching pre-trib. Time of Jacob's trouble. But brother says Christ, I'm always I'm open to talk with people. 
But like I said, if it's like the second time, third time, I might be like Paul where I say, after the sec first and second admonition, reject. But because of my love for somebody, I'll talk to them a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, fiftieth time. It's like, I should be done with them. But because of my love for them, I want to see them have the truth. Okay? You don't do that with everybody, but there's some people you have a love. Like Paul had a love for the Jewish people, and he kept saying, I'm done with them. But then he'd turn around and go back and preach truth to him again, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? And yet true. Verse 9, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. 10, as sorrowful. You mean we go through sorrow? We go through depression? Yet always rejoicing. What's different between us going through sorrow and then in the lost world going through sorrow? God gives us peace. I can be sorrowful, but God will still give me peace. I'm going to be going through hard, hard times. Everything we just listed there. But God will give us peace. The only man that knows real peace is a man that's saved. It's that simple. The also rejoicing as poor yet making many rich. I notice a lot of the love of money. A lot of men in ministry are starting to fall into the trap of the love of money. There's men that aren't in ministry. And women now working outside the home when they're supposed to be working in the home. I understand it's hard. I'm not using it as an attack, but I'm saying money starts becoming the foundation, and money starts making the decisions, and money starts doing the talking. The love of money starts coming in. Okay, We're poor, yet, but where's our riches? In heaven and in the Lord. And the Lord will still bless us with things today. He blesses with me things with me. Uh, my trips to Gold Beach, old-fashioned pizza, Go by the used bookstore. I found good Bibles, uh, some books from the used bookstore. It was a huge bookstore. Store now it's shrunk down. It's more of a art gallery, and the bottom half is art gallery, and the top half is books. So they had to condense it down. So now there's not as many books as there used to be. And I get to take trips to Crescent City. There's a place there I get to look for some books, walk on the beach, talk with the Lord. I gospel tract as I do both places. And sometimes God will bless you with things down here, physical things, and it's not wrong to have physical things. But we've got to remember that our, our riches are in heaven. Everything we get down here, we don't take it with us. Right? It's having nothing and yet possessing all things. The Bible talks about men in ministry, you're supposed to be content with food and raiment. I, I'll be honest with you, I have yet to come across anybody in, that claims to be in full-time ministry today, not in the past, today, that's in what they claim full-time ministry that's content with food and raiment. People can get upset. Well, I know it. If you're going to be honest, content with food and raiment. If they were content with food and raiment, they wouldn't be using those three tactics to get donations. Bullying, guilt tripping, and bribing. Okay. We talked about this in other studies. Okay. They wouldn't. Okay. Even Peter Ruckman, why do you copyright stuff? Copyrights for making money, and yet you look at all his stuff, all his stuff is copyrighted. Why? To make money. Now, he spent his money sometimes on good things, sometimes for himself. I'm not going to get into all that, but I'm just saying, today, P. Reckman's past. Today, finding a man of God that's in actual full-time ministry, and he's content with food and raiment. It's very hard to come across men like that today. Now, there might be some out there. I'm not saying I know every man that's preaching the truth out there. I don't know everybody out there that's preaching truth. I know some... But it's hard. I haven't come, I'm just saying, me personally, I haven't come across any man that's in ministry that claims to be in full-time ministry today and lives off donations from the brethren that's content with food and raiment. I haven't. Psalms 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But this is Christ, whatever you're going through, you're not alone. 
You might sit there and say, I alone, Lord, I alone am going through all this trouble. I alone am in suffering. I alone am, am being persecuted. Oh, Lord. No. There's 10, 000, or 7,000 priests that haven't bowed to Baal nor kissed him. There's tons of brethren out there, brother, says Christ, that are going through what you're going through. They're praying for you. Make sure you're praying for them. Stay in prayer. Stay in the Word of God. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Like I said, Satan likes to come in and poke the bad things in, in your life that you're supposed to be giving up for the Lord. If you let stuff in, it starts out small. He'll keep poking it, trying to get it to grow. And it's all your fault. It's not his fault. It's all your fault. If you let sin in your life, wickedness in your life, uh, resurrecting the old man, you start compromising. You start loving the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We talk about if you start conforming to the world, be not conformed to the world, but be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. These things Satan can entice you. He pokes it with temptation and entices you. Okay? And everything. Be sober, be vigilant. Okay? He's seeking to devour people. And like I said, the number one person that Satan goes to destroy a family is destroy a home, a godly home. He goes after the woman. And gets the woman to, to leave the boundaries that God set for her. He goes after the woman. When Satan's trying to destroy the body of Christ, you know the number one people person he goes after? Newly saved. When he wants to prevent people from getting saved, you know what he goes after? He, starts, he attacks the Word of God and tries to get rid of this book, the King James Bible. Okay. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in the brethren all around the world. You're not alone. You're not the only one, brother Jesus Christ. You're not the only one. Okay. Finally, brethren, 2 Timothy 4.1. 2 Timothy 4, chapter 1, or chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Two judgment. The judgment seat of Christ at his appearing and at his kingdom, the, the white throne judgment. Right. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Know what it means to be instant in season, out of season? People usually don't say this, but it means you're not only to preach the word, you're to live it. Whether it's in season or out of season, you're to live it. Okay, You're to preach it whether it's popular verbally, but you're also to live it. That's why it says be instant in season. Okay? Out of season. Reprove. Rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Remember, judgment begins here. Then the body of Christ. Make sure you're judging here first. Then the body of Christ. Then the lost world. With all long suffering and doctrine. 2 Timothy 2.15. Remember, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing, that's where you get your doctrine. I get my doctrines primarily from the Pauline epistles. Sometimes they overlap. You can see things. But pr primarily from the Pauline epistles. The reason I had a problem with that guy with post-trib is he was getting his doctrine from the Old Testament. He was getting his doctrine from the kingdom of heaven. From the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. That's not the gospel for today. He was getting very messed up because he wasn't rightly dividing. Okay. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We're in the falling away. It says endure sound doctrine. Not that they won't listen. Not that they won't believe sound doctrine. It says endure. In other words, they accepted it, but over time, they give it up. They don't endure. They don't survive. They don't last. Okay? They will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, the flesh gets in the way. The world gets in the way. 
Because the world, remember, the world's way is the flesh's way. It's always about enticing the flesh, pleasing the flesh. Right? But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of so-and-so. Okay. Teach, they, they start climbing, they start, you start going to preachers that tell you what you want to hear instead of telling you what you need to hear. And that's what I see more and more today. I see more brethren fall away because they're part of a club and they start going to people that teach them. I remember one guy that was on YouTube that he was preaching some truth. So he, he made a mess of the Bible in some areas. Come to find out, he loved video games and he was promoting video games. And he had a huge occult following because the men loved him, not because he was preaching truth, but because he was okay with video games and they wanted to be able to play video games. And they got away from men that, like me and other men in ministry that were preaching video games are sin and wickedness. You shouldn't be playing them. They're a waste of time. There's a lot of sin and wickedness within the video games. But they're designed to be addictive to pull you away from God. Okay? What is that? Having teachers having itching ears. They turn and go to people that tell them what they want to hear. They're okay with their sin. With them living the way they want to live instead of living God's way. Verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. What they stand for a lot of times, what they want to believe, has no basis in Scripture. None whatsoever. I was talking to a brother in Christ about angels. I said, you do realize in the Bible there's no such thing as a fallen angel? Let that one sink in. Chapter and verse where it, call, it says an angel is fallen. There's a cherub that is fallen. Satan. The anointed cherub. So it's, my, how thou hast fallen. Satan lost that. He's no longer the anointed cherub. He lost that position. That's what it means by fallen. He lost that position. In the Bible, it's just, I could do a whole study on it, but angels in the Bible, it's, they're always leaving their first estate. In the Old Testament, uh, before the flood, they left their first estate. I believe they used uh, Jacob's ladder. If you remember the story about Jacob's ladder, he, gives us a, he had a dream about this ladder where angels are ascending and descending. Why? Because angels don't have wings. How's that one too? Okay, fables. Angels don't have wings. There's no such thing as a fallen angel. There's only angels that leave their first estate. Fast forward to Revelation where it talks about the, the, when Satan gets kicked out of heaven, he draws a third of the stars with his tail. Some people say, well, they got kicked out of heaven. I don't believe that. I believe they follow Satan through Abraham or Jacob's ladder down here to the earth. They follow him down. They leave their first estate and come down here. But bottom line, the Bible never once says they're fallen angels. There's no such thing as fallen angels. There's angels that leave their first estate. And they end up going to hell. There was angels in hell that were reserved in chains in hell. The angels from the flood. They're in hell and chains reserved unto the day of judgment. We read about the day of judgment. Okay. That is appearing and the kingdom. The two times God's going to be judging a huge judgments. Okay. But that digress. Fables. you got people that just believe stuff that's like, where did you get that? That's not even in the Bible. Okay. And then you have times... Flip it around. Then you have times where they'll say, that's not in the Bible, and you have to flip it over. There was a verse when I remember getting to a discussion with somebody in the comments section on one of Brian Denlinger's when it was King James Video Ministries. He had, he had made the statement that God elevates His Word above His name. And there was people in the comments saying, that's not in the Bible, that's not in the Bible. And you turn to Psalms. I think it's Psalms of Proverbs where it says, I will worship towards thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. There's times where people will believe what you're telling them is fables. And you, here it is. See, there's two sides to that coin. Okay. But mainly what this is talking about is people uh, making up things that have no basis in Scripture. They want to believe what they want to believe. They don't want truth. They want to believe what they want to believe. Verse 5. But watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. There it is. Endure again. Endure affliction. 
We need to endure the sorrow that we go through, the depression. We need to endure, like I said, I've been stabbed in the back by a brother I love and care about, and I keep praying for him all the time. I talk to the Lord about Brian Denlinger all the time. I mention him here a few times. I pray for the man, okay? I'm enduring affliction, being hurt by brethren that I love and care about, being stabbed in the back. I could be wrong in some areas, and he's 100% right, but how he's going about proving he's right, he's stabbing people in the back. He's going about it wrong. I still believe he's wrong in the areas that we disagree on. Uh, the big areas. He's turned his back on looking for that blessed hope. He's turned his back on. He'll say, no, I haven't. Yeah, you have. Do you believe that Jesus Christ could come back today? Are you looking for him to come back today with the life that you're living? Well, I don't believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. You don't believe Paul was doing that? You don't believe all the Christians all the way up to today were doing that? He's wrong in that area. That's where we disagree big time. And I think that's what's hurting him the most. Is once he did that, he really started going downhill. And the other thing was Christmas. Disagree on Christmas. Okay? But you have to endure affliction. I disagree with him, but I didn't stab him in the back. He can try to say I did, but... You got... I don't want to go off on this too much. Please forgive me, brothers of Christ. Please forgive me. I don't want to go off... You have people that have um, persecution complex. And then there's people that are actually persecuted. Right? But, brothers of Christ, you're going to get persecuted. Absolutely. Don't get a persecution complex. Endure affliction. Take it. Give it to the Lord. Praise God for it. Give God the glory. Give God all the thanks. Praise God for it. But watch thou and all. That's the biggest thing. Give it to the Lord. If you're with your one-on-one -on -one walk with the Lord, you talk with the Lord and you give things to the Lord that, that hurt. You give men to the Lord. You give women to the Lord, whether they're saved or lost. You give people to the Lord that have hurt you or that you're praying for that you definitely want, they've fallen and you want to see them get back up. Okay. Maybe you're praying for them financially. Just simple, like, worldly things, like financially. Food and raiment. Okay? Do the work of an evangelist. Remember, this is to, to Timothy that's in ministry. An evangelist is a man in ministry that's going around... I don't want to get too much off on this. I got into this with feminists because they're saying, oh, women can, can be uh, evangelists. No. Evangelist is an office for just a man. When, men and women are, can be witnesses. We're all to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. But an evangelist is actually an office for a man that goes around and not only preaches the gospel, but he sets up churches. He goes around confirming the churches. He sets up bishops and deacons. Women aren't supposed to do that. Only men are evangelists. Okay, I, I, It's a whole other study, but Philip the evangelist, not once is a woman ever called an evangelist in the Bible. Timothy's being told a man in ministry. Only men are in, in ministry when it comes to the offices that are in ministry. Okay, We're all in the ministry of reconciliation. We can all be a witness. I'm not an evangelist. But I witness for Jesus Christ whenever I can. I go out my gospel track here and there, but I'm not an evangelist. I don't travel around preaching the word of God, leading people to Christ, founding churches, setting up churches, confirming churches. I don't. That's what an evangelist does. Anyway, make full, uh, do the work of evangelist. He's talking to Timothy here. Okay? But if you do, brothers, brothers in Christ, if you do get called into a ministry where you're an evangelist, and you do a lot of traveling around, preaching the gospel, setting up churches, confirming the churches. Make sure you're doing the work properly and you're doing it, giving it your all. Okay? Make full proof of thy ministry. Okay? Make full proof of thy ministry. Okay? Remember, it starts once again with the self then the body of Christ, then the lost world, in that order. With your walk with the Lord, with judgment, make sure your walk is strong. Anything happens to, you, to me on YouTube or other preachers, whether it be attacks from the lost world, or we, tend to, we fall away, or we tend to get into depression, and we decide to hide for a little bit. Forgive me, brothers of Christ. Um, I just was getting so frustrated. I'm not going to get into too much of it, but I, I've just been burned again by brethren, and uh, uh, three, four months ago, and I just, 
I could come out with videos attacking them and then Earth all of a sudden, not attacking them, I, I can come out with videos showing what they did, showing them for who they are, and then the next thing you know, you got fighting among the brethren and division and and fight, 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 and just I just got to the point where it's like, Lord, what do I do? I mean, I, I can make a, lots of videos about, you know, all the brethren in ministry that have hurt me, brethren that aren't in ministry that have hurt me. Uh, videos about, but would I be just, would it become a wine fest where I'm just whining? Am I, what we just read there, enduring affliction, or am I whining and complaining about it? Keep living for Jesus Christ according to his word. Yes, men and men, real quick, men in ministry are to call out false teachers, false teachings. We're supposed to protect the flock. But I'm just saying, it gets to the point where protecting the flock is almost like a, a job that can't get done. Because you ever heard those jobs? It's 24 7. Well, it's more like, you know, 48 7. <laughs> but there ain't 48 hours in, in a day. There's only 24. Yeah, we can't. It just seems like no matter how much we do, we can't keep up with it. And if all we did was that, how are we supposed to get any preaching done when we're preaching the Word, when it comes to doctrines, for instruction, righteousness, encouraging the brethren? It's like, we're living in the last days, brothers and Christ. We're in the last days. If there are good men in ministry that would still talk to me, that godly men, I'd take advice from them, you know? It just seems like, you know, we're burning ourselves out in these last days. But brother, sister Christ, keep living for Jesus Christ according to his word. Keep taking his word, hiding it in your heart, and living it. I pray that you start your day with the word of God and that you, you pray every day and end every day that way. With prayer and the word of God. Get back to living for Jesus Christ in the life that you're living every day, brother, sister Christ. Regardless what's going on online, regardless what's going on in the world, that you're living for Jesus Christ every day. And please, please, please keep praying for me. Keep praying for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Keep praying to the Lord, taking yourself to Him one on one. You know, judgment starts here. Take yourself to God and talk, talking to God about you and say, Lord, am I living right? Am I doing right? If I failed you here, where do I need help? Maybe you already know where you need help. Take that to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I need more courage here. I, I need some help here, Lord. I, I have these questions I can't seem to answer, Lord. I need your help. I remember coming across things in the Bible that seem like I hit a brick wall. I don't get this, Lord. It's almost like a contradiction. I don't understand. They're trying to tell me it's this way. The Holy Spirit in me is saying it's not that way. But I, I need your help. And I had to fall on my knees before the Lord and say, Lord, I desperately need your help opening the scriptures to me. And he showed me truth. And it was amazing. Stay in the word of God. Stay in prayer, brother, sister Christ. Don't get caught up in the name calling. Don't get caught up in the backbiting and whispering. If you haven't taught, said it to the person's face, it's one of those things is if you haven't said it to the person's face, you shouldn't really be talking about it, okay, behind their back. If you would say it to their face, then by all means, you know, it's one of those things where you're going to, through the Holy Spirit, be careful because it's, it's, it can border on just you start getting into gossip. You never told it to their face. You never would say it to their face. It becomes backbiting and whispering. It becomes gossip. Don't fall into that, okay? And, uh, Lord, brother, sister Christ, I love you. I'm sorry that I've been absent these past three months plus. I'm just, I'm just going through depression, and I'm going through a lot of brethren that I love and care about turning on me, stabbing me in the back, and it just seems to be the, that everyone just loves to fight and bicker. There's good fights and there's fighting just for fighting's sake. Fight the good fight, but a lot of people are just fighting to fight. And the thing that gets me is I understand disagreements, you disagree with me, that's fine, but we're not doing it in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. We're not doing it with love. We're not fearing God and we're not truly loving Jesus Christ or we're not truly loving the brethren with our actions and how we go about our disagreements and how we treat one another. And though we're not, are we being there for one another? I'm just really getting burnt out. Okay? So keep praying for me, and I'm praying for you, brothers and Christ. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, I, I'm praying for you. Please pray for me. 
and um, I'm here. I got my email. I'll, real quick, email. I got emails from some brethren that I haven't responded to, and, I, and it's over the last three months. Please forgive me. I will get to them and get you an email in the, in the next week. I just, please, I'm sorry. I just, I got burnt out. I just didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to have anything to do anything. Uh, my prayer life started hurting. My Bible reading life started hurting a little bit. And I just, I, Lord, I alone have been left. No, you're not. And even if you were, that doesn't justify not still fighting for me. That doesn't justify not praying and reading the Word of God every day. Okay. I was struggling in these last three months. And those that have been praying for me, thank you. I mean that. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. My love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm, I'm going to put out one more other study, and after that, I don't know. After that, I don't know. But we're going to do another study. Uh, are you going to Nineveh or Tarsus? Okay, something along those lines. I don't know if I'll call it exactly that, but something to do with are you, are you living in Nineveh? Are you at, you know, are you at Nineveh or are you living in Tarsus? Okay. And that's another thing that's part of the, my uh, depression. You know? uh, trying to push God. I'm trying to do, say, God, I want this and I want that. And God's like, that's not what I want for you. A lot of people are trying to live in Tarsus, especially men in ministry. They're trying to live in Tarsus. They're not going to Nineveh. They're not living in Nineveh. They're not living with what God wants for them or what God has for them are being content with what God has for him. And that's that's where I failed. Like I said, we'll do a study on it. So I will see you guys in the next study. Uh, I'll probably break this up into two. But I do love you, my brother says Christ. I'm praying for you. And I'll just see you in the next study.